Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. This is Jill. Have you ever wondered how you can observe life in a better way so that you can see more about what's going on around you? That's what we'll talk about today. Now is the dramatic moment of fate, Watson, when you hear a step up the stairs, which is walking into your life, and you know not whether it's for good or ill. Sherlock Holmes by Arthur Conan Doyle. Last week, we talked about how Sherlock Holmes thinking and thinking outside the box could help us do a better job about figuring out what's going on and coming up with good solutions to the problems we have. This week, we'll talk about observation and how we can be better at it and how we can use deductive thinking to make better decisions. He says that we haven't really sharpened our skills in such a way that we can see the world for what it actually is, that we have observational talents, that we have ways of observing details and then making appropriate decisions based on what we see. He says, quote, we have been content to go about life half blind and oblivious to the ways we can still improve ourselves and our lives by giving a little bit more effort into sharpening our skills in observation and deduction. So he asked the question that if we want to become masters of observation, we want to become better at it, how can we go about doing that? And he said that there are five different skills when becoming better at observation. He says the first is to become a more detailed person. Two, give 100% of your focus. Boy, that's hard to do. Three, notice the difference from baseline. You might notice that a lot of times when we're ever looking at something, we're not really trying to determine if something is or is not. We're trying to determine how different it was from the last time we saw it. That's what baseline is. Four, understand people's self-perceptions. And five, see the big picture. He says, first of all, that if we want to become more detail-oriented, that we just have to do a better job of paying attention, paying attention to the little things that we tend to overlook. And that can be hard to do. We're not really trained to do it. But people like investigators and scientists and all other types of occupations, they train themselves on becoming better at looking at the details. And you just may not be in an occupation or a situation where you learned how to do it. So this is where he talks about how we can try to train ourselves to do better. He says that we have to do a lot of exercises where we try to recall finer details about the world around us and practice on it all the time. Then once we notice the details, there's that second part. We have to remember the details. I'm sure that there are a ton of things that we see around us, but we just forget that we saw it. I remember at one point I got into trying to sharpen my attention skills better. So when I would go into a restaurant or I'd go into a situation with customers, I would try to do these weird types of exercises. Like, quick, how many people in the room, without looking at them, are wearing red shirts right now? Or how many men versus women are there? How many tall people are in the room? Just any type of detail I could do, I would quiz myself on to see if I could remember those things around me. And I'll tell you, it is really hard to do. And it does get better as you get more practice. By challenging yourself over and over again, you'll be able to start doing better and start noticing things. And he said a part of this is the fact that we're just too rushed. We rush through everything. We rush through our lives. And part of picking up these details is allowing ourselves to have the time, the quietness, to have that level of focus that we have to slow down in order to remember small details about what's going on around us. And as we learn to observe more and we start doing better, you'll be able to remember more of it too. All it takes is starting to do that challenge. I started trying to observe things like emergency exits about a decade ago after I read a book called The Survivor's Club, The Secrets and Science That Could Save Your Life by Ben Sherwood. And the whole book talks about different types of tragedies where people either survive or don't survive. He gave one example of a boat that crashed 147 feet from shore. The water was shallow enough to walk back to shore, yet about 43 people died because there was panic and an inability of the people on the boat to collect themselves to just walk back to shore. He mentions that a lot of people survive airplane crashes. 
And this is when I was first starting my new job and I was really nervous about flying on a plane. He said that most people do survive the crashes. Most of them aren't entirely fatal. But the secret is that people have about 90 seconds to get off of a plane if it does crash. That is primarily because of the smoke and the chemicals and the chaos going on inside the plane. All it took was to spend a few minutes noting where the emergency doors are and counting the seats to the emergency door. Because when it gets dark and smoky and full of chaos, you may not see the emergency exits in front of you. You might also check for the emergency exits behind you and count how many rows so that you can walk up and down the aisles counting the seats that exist to those emergency outlets. And what's interesting about it is, isn't that exactly what the airplane staff keep asking us to do? They keep asking us to pay attention to the emergency exits. And that's because they know statistically people will survive if they know where they are. So I started this interesting exercise where I just always observe where the emergency exits are, whether I'm on an airplane, in a restaurant, or in a movie theater. I always try to pay attention to the location and some big keys of how I could get there if it was really cloudy or smoky. And that's what this book about observational skills is talking about, coming up with some key details of people in the room, who is where, what they're wearing. And as you get better and better at these skills, you'll become more observational as you go around your day. And he says, as you get better and better at it, you can start looking for smaller and smaller details, things that are harder to remember and things that are harder to see. You want to become good at those details. You've probably always seen those Sherlock Holmes investigator styles television shows. Psych, which is a comedy detective show, you'll always see that he notices the smallest details about people. Like they say they're married, but they have no wedding ring and there's a tan line right where the wedding ring used to be. or Someone who is supposedly well-to-do has a rip in his suit. Why would the suit be not in perfect shape if he was doing really as well as he says he is? So the whole point is to get good at sharpening your details and sharpening the things that you pay attention to so that you can get better at it. He says that you can start by also noting 10 things of detail around you. And what it'll do once we start making notes of the things around us and paying attention to things we weren't paying attention, it will cause us to slow down. It will cause us to pay bigger attention and it'll help us with our memory. It might also be a good idea, and I try to do this all the time, is to not just note the things about the person, what color clothes they're wearing, how tall they are, anything like that. Remember the things they tell you. If you remember things that they tell you, It will also help you slow down, pay attention, and get that attention to detail. The bonus skill is that will also help you with that relationship with that person. I always try to remember things about my customer. So if I run into someone who says that they love to go fishing, I know three other customers in that room who also like to go fishing, and I make introductions between them so they will become conference buddies and meet other people who are like them who also share some interests with them. So it's a bonus type of skill to just listen to what people say about themselves. And he says, unfortunately, we live in a world full of distractions and things trying to gain our attention, and there's probably not a lot we can do about it. It's just the way our world is. So we're going to have to learn how to have focus in a world of distraction. And of course, it always starts by doing it slowly, and starting with a single small step. And he mentions a different theory in the book where we try to find things that are common among all cultures or common among all people. How can we get to know the people around us better? He said that you can notice certain tics, like maybe a person always touches their ear or plays with their earring or adjusts their suit. I can't tell you how many times people kept talking about Captain Picard on Star Trek and how he kept yanking down on his uniform, and I never really noticed. That was bad on me. And as soon as someone brought it up, I started noticing it. Not only that, I started noticing people playing with their outfit in real life, because it's a sign that 
their clothes aren't really comfortable or they're not wearing something that they're used to wearing. But then you see those people in those suits or those dresses and those very nice business outfits and they look like a million bucks and you can tell they're very comfortable in it. It says something about them. He says that you can also pay attention to the distance if they're talking to other people in the room. You can see who they're talking to and notice other factors in there. Are people wearing insignias or jewelry that indicates anything about religion or politics or tells you something about themselves? There was always a story about Madeleine Albright about how you could tell what mood she was in based on the brooch she was wearing on her suit. And she started explaining that when she was going to be tough, she wore one particular brooch. When she was feeling particularly annoyed that day, she wore a different brooch. So you could tell a lot by her mood if you could decode her signals. So that's another thing to pay attention to. It's also interesting too that if you're having a conversation and you notice that people are getting uptight or upset or they look like they're trying to leave the conversation, figure out what it was that was causing them discomfort. Maybe you can fix the conversation or you know not to bring up that topic again. In episode 35 of this podcast, we talked about a book that will help you notice what's going on around you with different types of skills and strategies and exercises you can do to be more observational. This book was The Art of Noticing. That's what he's talking about here. How can we notice more? The next part of the book talks about ways that you can be better at critical thinking. He says that we need to use the skills of deduction, which he says is actually reverse storytelling, which means that you're trying to tell a story based on what you observe. For example, when I mentioned about the psych detective who noticed that there was a rip in the suit, that it was well-worn, that this guy was talking about how wealthy he is. He was using his deductive skills to give him the story that this man is not as wealthy as he's claiming to be. But writing these reverse stories will help you in your deductive skills. He says that it helps then that we take in all that information for our observations, and now we're able to actually use it in that deductive thinking. He says that if you wanted to, you could even make a fishbone diagram that allow you to identify multiple causes and effects or pieces of the puzzle so that you can tell what it is you actually saw. Then you can even investigate what people are saying. How can you determine the motivations then behind what people are doing? I'm not a big fan generally of trying to determine people's motivations. It is often wrong. We often put the worst take on what other people's motivations are. And at the same time, we give ourselves the best take of what our motivations are. So I think that recommendation is a bit dangerous. But what can you learn from the conversations that will help you understand what's going on in the situation, maybe without trying to deduct what the motivations are? And then come up with some takeaways from this entire situation, whatever it is you were learning, whatever it is you were observing. Maybe you noticed someone who was in a restaurant, they were eating alone, they look aggravated, they picked up their phone frequently. Now, with deductive theories, can you go ahead and piece together a story to improve your deductive thinking? It'll help you in problem solving and basically using these situations as thought experiments to help you do better. He says it helps, too, that if we have some psychological distance from whatever it is we're trying to observe, if we get wrapped up in it or we're wrapped up in the person that we're trying to observe, it can actually taint what we're thinking. Again, I think it gets back into that motivation. If we're giving ourselves the best possible motivation and everyone else the worst possible motivation and we are tied up to that person emotionally, we can actually damage relationships. So making sure that when you're doing these types of deductive observational exercises that you have a little bit of a distance between you and your subject. And he said there's probably more perspectives out there. Can you explore some of those? You came up with a theory. You think you know what's going on. You came up with a deductive reasoning. Maybe you could think of a few more. Maybe think about other people and what they would say about it. He says, what would Sigmund Freud say about it? Or cheerleader or Eeyore the donkey. Good perspectives that will help you think outside the box about whatever situation it is you're observing. 
And he said that once you start gaining those critical thinking skills, you'll be able to understand connections between ideas and people and actions and start to be able to detect inconsistencies or mistakes in what's going on. And that will help your problem solving do a lot better than it has been doing. It can help explain things that are going on that maybe not everyone noticed. I have a friend and she is fantastic about it. We used to play a video game together and anytime there was some sort of scam going on, she was able to pick it up quickly. She always knew when someone was lying about their intentions and it has a lot to do, I think, with her art of noticing and her critical thinking skills. She also doesn't get wrapped up into the drama that's going on, which also helps her become better at coming up with these deductive reasons. He says that the first thing you have to do when you're trying to gain some psychological distance from something is to not take anything at face value. That as soon as you start making assumptions, that's when things are going to go wrong. And that's when things are going to start to give you the misleading information because now you're wrapped up in your own theory about it, your own perspective about it, or if you're taking it at face value, what that other person is trying to sell you. All of those may be fallacies. So if you can stay independent, even from your own thinking, then you'll be better for it. Then he says you can start doing your own research. If you have to research into a situation to solve a problem, do your homework and do the research to come up with the best answer possible. He says it's important that we look for assumptions in our research and in our decisions. Sometimes they'll lead us astray. Also, don't think that you're right all the time. We love to think we're right. We love to think the other person's wrong, but that's not always the case. So make sure you challenge everyone in this particular situation you're trying to observe, including yourself. He says that you should think about cause and effect. So we have to get away from that kind of correlation thinking and try to actually find real causes and effects instead of the ones we make up in our minds or the ones that are misleading and are not related to causes. So my challenge to you is try this week to come up with one instance where you're paying a lot of detail to a situation. Maybe you're observing someone in a restaurant, or maybe you're looking at someone in a Zoom meeting and you see the background behind them, the artwork on the wall. What do you notice and what story can you deduce from what you're seeing in front of you? And now our fun entertainment quote of the week comes from, of course, Sherlock. But this Sherlock Holmes is from 1984. Uh, You mentioned your name just now as if I should recognize it, but I can assure you beyond the obvious facts that you are a bachelor, a solicitor, and a Freemason, and an asthmatic. I know nothing about you, whatever. And you see right there how Sherlock uses the power of his observation to tell all these details about this guy in the room with him, who is quite shocked to realize how many things Sherlock knows about him. And that's why we have to learn our observational skills. All right, everyone, thanks so much. Please remember that you can leave a review, subscribe to the podcast, or go to my website, smallstepspod.com. Have a wonderful week.